Hello, everyone, and welcome to this bonus episode of the Hired Geek Podcast, episode number 86, uh, that is exploring the unschooled documentary film uh, that uh, I had the chance to get a uh, kind of a press screening of. Um, I was planning on seeing it uh, on site at South by Southwest EDU. I one that was still planning uh, uh, to happen uh, in March. So uh, in lieu of that, uh, thankfully, I was still able to watch the film, still able to talk with the folks uh, uh, that are involved in uh, making it and promoting it. So uh, it is a uh, film that's exploring uh, self-directed learning uh, for uh high school students and kind of below, you know, students at a variety of ages. Uh, But uh, it's taking place at the Natural Creativity Center in Philadelphia. Um, They're just doing really interesting work that sort of, uh, you know, they describe it, uh, you know, in the podcast, but really just as kind of reimagining um, the homeschool models, technically what the their organization is uh, uh, classified as. It's not a charter school or anything like that, but um, it was just a really fascinating conversation. It really helped me to process uh, something that was definitely pretty foreign to me, um, you know, obviously being uh, more so in the high red world, but we get into uh, examining how, you know, there's some kind of connective tissue there of uh, how students who are going through self-directed learning are uh, as well or perhaps better prepared for their success in college. So um, really great stuff, great resources to check out in the show notes. Be sure to uh, subscribe to their newsletter uh, so that you can know when they're going to have any more screenings or how this movie might be uh, released to be viewed on demand in the near future. Um, and definitely check out all their resources uh, that they have on their website, as well as all the things that I mentioned in this episode uh, in the show notes. So uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, and without further ado, this is episode number 86 with Chris Steinmeier and Bonnie Benjamin Ferris. So I uh, really appreciate uh, you, Bonnie and Chris, uh, hanging out for the podcast here. We have a lot to discuss uh, about this awesome documentary I had the pleasure of uh, checking out recently, Unschooled. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about just uh, the film at large and kind of how it got to be uh, made, but also just sort of the uh, educational philosophies behind uh, the Natural Creativity Center that is uh, highlighted in the film. So I uh, really appreciate uh, both of your time, but um, we'll start out. Uh, we'll start with you, Chris. Uh, we'll start out kind of as we always do. If you just want to give a real brief uh, introduction of yourself, uh, a little bit of your background. And uh, so, yeah, we'll start with you, Chris, and then we'll go to you, Bonnie. Sure. Uh, I'm Chris Steinmeier, uh, co-director of the Natural Creativity Center uh, in Philadelphia. We're in the Germantown neighborhood. Um, and uh, I got into the work of self-directed education uh, when I had the epiphany in grad school that I was a great student and a a pretty mediocre adult. Um, I had uh, always done well in school, knew how to get A's, uh, and then I got out into the real world and had no earthly idea what to do with myself. Uh, And so I went into teaching. In doing so, uh, it, it helped me open up and figure out a lot more about what learning actually was, what what the, the purpose, the role, and the connections. And so I taught in uh, private schools, public schools, Montessori, a juvenile justice program, uh, ended up back in grad school because uh, I wanted to do something more, but I didn't know what. Uh, and that uh, I happened to have a professor turn over uh, an article on the modernization of homeschooling um, and and how it wasn't just this fringe thing anymore. Uh, and it just piqued my curiosity. I got really invested, really interested, ended up writing my dissertation on non-religious homeschoolers in and around Philadelphia, uh, and then came to learn of the impending opening of what would become natural creativity. Very cool. Um, yeah, Bonnie, if you just want to give a quick intro of your background. Sure. Bonnie Benjamin. Benjamin Ferris and Dustin, thank you so much for having us today. Um, my role on this project is as the impact director for the film and the campaign, and that's really how I've spent the lion's share of my career. I I live at this nexus of media and story and change. I started my career the first decade at PBS, the next decade at the Walt Disney World Company, and then I. Um, ran Vulcan Productions, which is the media company of um, the late co-founder of Microsoft's Paul Allen. And where I live and and what brings me joy is to help um, use the power of story to bring people together um, to leave the world better than we found it. 
Uh, and so it's a joy to be here today with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both so much uh, for making the time. Um, so, uh, really quick, Bonnie, just to kind of give a little bit of foundation. So, um, I'm very curious, like, cause I think this is, I mean, it's a unique school, unique model and like, you know, this could have just been happening on its own, but we were lucky enough to be able to kind of see it happen through this film. So I'm curious, like, how did this film come to be even, uh, because I think, again, yeah, it's just something that maybe it could have been just such a small and quiet kind of intimate thing that was happening on its own. But again, we got the you know the chance to see it through this documentary. So how did it how did it come to be? No, I love it. Um, and the film, the documentary film is called Unschooled. And it started out as a film about the revolutionary alternatives uh, to traditional education. And it, it its genesis um, by the executive producers was they had personal experience with this kind of self-directed education model. The film quickly morphed as, as after filming began into a story about the larger issues facing us as a whole and the educational systems that are offered to our young people today. Um, the film itself follows the work of Natural Creativity, where Chris is the co-director, and a group of very brave families who seek an alternative to traditional education models, models, um, the traditional models that are not serving their, true, their children. The filmmakers uh, were intrigued to do document the journey of the three young people you meet in the film as they put this model of self-directed education to the test. I also want to say that I think this film and uh, reimagining how we think about education and learning is so profoundly important uh, in general and particularly powerfully important today, um, never more so um, because nine out of 10 young people are learning in their home right now. And so mm -hmm. nothing's really going to be the same. And so not only is this global pandemic a, a, a profound challenge on lots of levels, but it's also an opportunity um, to, to really rethink and reimagine what we think of as learning and how we support our children's learning. So that's what we hope this film will do. Yeah, very admirable goal and definitely very intriguing. Um, you're saying this unique self-directed educational model and something that, you know, a lot of people may not be familiar with. And um, Chris, I'll give this one to you. Um, you know, again, it's something pretty unique and certainly it's like this question could be taken kind of like all things being equal or certainly, uh, you know, in this unique context that we're in now, you know, do you think that this kind of general model of self-directed learning, you know, in K through 12, do you think that, you know, it's something that should be more prevalent and that's what you hope maybe kind of like, people take away? Or is this something that you feel like is really valuable in those smaller, more intimate kind of uh, places? Uh, I was just curious. That's something that came to me when I was watching this. of was like, is this something that like the intention is that like every school everywhere should be doing this for all students all the time? Or is it like useful as this very unique, intimate kind of uh, alternative that um, people could kind of opt into? Well, uh, as we uh, often talk about ad natural creativity. Uh, whenever presented with an either or, we always try and look for the and. Um, and mm. and so I think that uh, this makes a lot of sense as a both. Um, in in one way, the the principles, the ideas of turning over more autonomy, more control over content to individual families, individual communities, uh, makes so much sense. And I wish. Uh, that would be much more prevalent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think uh, there is one right way. Um, it's almost like uh, if we were to develop a sort of constitution of self-directed education um, that uh, many people could share in the practices, but do it in ways that make sense for their particular context, uh, it would be really, really great. It's almost like what the uh, the origins of the charter school movement were, where the idea is how do we have a bunch of different approaches, a, br a bunch of different laboratories for innovation and see what comes up. Um, and so uh, I think we'd really be excited to find out all over the world that people were taking some of these principles and, and making them really specific to their communities and their needs. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's like a really interesting way to look at it, which I, I, that's also what I love is just sort of the like open-mindedness generally that feels like a, like a, kind of resonated with me of just seeming to be a very core value of like, yeah, it's not, everything's, uh, 
you know, there's a lot of shades gray, like everything's very nuanced and like in depth and uh, those sort of things of that idea of, yeah, like people could be inspired to kind of uh, remix and mash up that idea of like, yeah, more autonomy and, um, you know, uh, bringing in more self-direction into uh, learning as it makes sense uh, in all the variety of kind of uh, context that anybody might be uh, learning within. So, um, but I, I think too, and uh, this is kind of more overarching in terms of just like, the production of the film. Um, so I'll give this one to you, Bonnie, really quick of just like, you know, again, it is, it's so unique and, um, you know, stuff that anybody might not be as familiar with or comfortable with in terms of like when they think about sending their kid to school, um, you know, you explore sort of a lot of that skepticism in this film. So I was just curious of like, what made that important for you to show? Cause I feel like there's a version of a movie like that, you know, like a documentary like this, where it's just very like, you know, everything's perfect, you know, not, you know, like they're trying to really kind of like hype it up and like, just ignore any sort of criticism. So I was just curious, you know, why was it important? I think to highlight that it was kind of a brave choice for these families to uh, buy into this model and um, those sort of things. So um, just the yeah, Atticus kind of a production question of like including that in the film. What a great question. And one of the things that I think um, is so powerful about this film is that it's not all tied up in a, a neat little ribbon of perfection. Um, we meet three young people and their families and their parents who all have various degrees of skepticism around whether this is the right way to go. And we follow their journey, both the family's journey, the parent's journey, and the young people's journey into figuring out if this is right for them. Um, and I think the, the film, I know the film really um, is, a, is an instigator, is a fuel for the kinds of questions all of us ask when we think about what's best for our children, what's, what kind of an environment is best for them, what, um, how can we set them up for success. And so you put your, your finger right on it. The, the film very deliberately is, um, is I'll, I'll use the word messy in a, in a sense that it's not this linear process of perfection. Um, you see the, the whole trajectory, um, including doubts along the way. Yeah. Like learning is a complicated process, like anywhere. And the fact that like, it's yeah, like self-directed and just sort of, yeah, kind of done in like this scrappy way, but it just, it was so powerful. Yeah. To see like those breakthrough moments and when things are really, um, you know, really clicking into place with the students. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it just feels, yeah, so authentic in a, in a way that just feels very human to, yeah, like include that, uh, kind of raw part of it. That's like, yeah, not like clean and tight and all that sort of thing. So if I might build on that, the, the, the messiness, um, is really, um, an important part of it. So I was glad that, that Bonnie used that exact word. Uh, when we're working with new families, um, uh, people who are interested in, in supporting us, people who would like to find out more about how to apply this approach or, or what the sort of challenges are, um, we, we really want to engage with the doubts, the concerns, the things that they're worried about, uh, because those are real and, and will impact uh, what their journey is. And so we want those to be out in front of people. Also, the, the idea that um, when you turn over the, the keys to the vehicle to a young person, uh, there's a, a, a potentially a misconception where the job for the adult gets easier um, and that's actually in our experience in, in, in our coaching, very much not, not the case. And so we like to be upfront about that and, and really sit with the, the messiness. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, cause you're, yeah, I guess that's like probably, I'm sure a common misconception is like, Oh, well like, yeah, like the students doing all the work is self-directed. Like, well, you, you know, like you're just kind of sitting back and like doing whatever. <laughs> so, um, so I think, I mean, that kind of segues really well. I mean, just going to you again, Chris, to start with this one, I'm just like, you know, just generally, and I, I love just like thinking of it in this way um, of kind of like in the geeky fashion, like learning is a human superpower. Like we, you know, see patterns and like, you know, develop things. And especially when we're younger, we're, you know, learning so much so quickly and are just kind of sponges for all the things that are happening around us. And certainly now with so many more people, like we we're kind of alluding to before are essentially you know, homeschooling their children with, you know, perhaps very little preparation. So, um, you know, just looking at it in that way of like, you know, 
creating more moments for learning, you know, in young people's everyday life, uh, you know, whatever their age and uh, wherever they are, um, you know, just talking through that of like, how do you create more moments for those things? And just, you know, I guess taking the inspiration from the work that you're doing every day and how maybe others, you know, who are now thrust into homeschooling their children, like how they can perhaps, you know, create more of those kind of opportunities for learning in their, you know, child's everyday life. Uh, sure. Uh, I think one of the the ways that I, I like to, to begin diving into that is uh, to first start to challenge the notion that uh, we as adults uh, have a responsibility to create learning opportunities. Um, the, the sort of the superpower that you reference is built into us uh, from birth and you know, some could make the argument even before that, where the the neural connections, the ways that your your brain is is forming and understanding and interacting with the world, uh, is happening in ways that uh, are are rich and deep, even when the young person doesn't have the language mm-hmm. to articulate it. And so, uh, it's it's it the the adult um, can increase access, uh, exposure to new things. Um, modeling of, of connection making between things that, that maybe aren't immediately apparent to the, to the young person. Um, but often also just get out of the way and observe. Uh, I think your comment about the, the, the sponginess of, of young minds is really important right now because they're soaking up a lot and something that, that I know parents I speak to would wish they didn't about the state of the world, about the anxiety, the stress, uh, just the general tone um, and fear, um, sort of a, a slow burn fight or flight for so many of us. Uh, and so uh, our encouragement for, for people who find themselves in that situation with young people right now is uh, to really be present with that emotional well-being, uh, that sense of self, that sense of place making in the world, um, and maybe not necessarily going into the details of why this is, depending on the age of the young person and, and what kind of access they have, but but really being present to their emotions, their feelings, what kinds of needs they're having, um, and even as we, in, you know, some places start to open back up, you have young people that, for whatever the challenges have been, have had weeks of really intense uh, uh, mom and dad time. Um, and for some, that's going to come to a pretty abrupt uh, change. Um, others not so quickly, but but sort of being, being aware that young people uh, experience these transitions um, in more profound ways than, than we've trained ourselves to as adults, uh, and, and including that in, in any articulation of the learning process, sort of learning how to be resilient people uh, means being there with your parents as as we model being resilient people. I think that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, the way that you framed it of like, almost kind of like letting yourself off the hook a little bit of like, you know, in terms of like, just like the learning, you can kind of take a coaching backseat, perhaps a little bit and just sort of guide, uh, you know, your child a little bit. And then, you know, so much of also just, yeah, like the disruption of routines and just sort of the fight or flight kind of stuff you mentioned too, of like, almost more so where it might be valuable to step in is just like helping your child to feel safe, like try to like, you know, replicate the routine as much as you can, or, um, you know, just, yeah, spend quality time and be, you know, helping them to, uh, feel loved and feel, uh, you know, like they're having some fun or something, you know, like those sort of things. But, um, cause yeah, I'm sure that's just like, uh, a lot of pressure that uh, some parents are putting on themselves are just like, oh, I got to, you know, I got to now be like a, you know, like a teacher, like, I don't know what I'm doing or whatever. And they're like, you know, yeah, just getting so kind of worked up about that. Yeah, I was I was speaking with a parent um, who was expressing great worry about uh, her young person uh, falling behind. And, and we sort of took some time to unpack what that really meant. And uh, at the end of the conversation, uh, she was able to, to, to be able to say, you know, if I meet my my child uh, 20 years from now um, and we're, we're going to reflect back on this moment, like I want my, my, my daughter to be able to uh, know 
what to do in challenging times much more than this week's fraction lessons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like there, there are going to be times that you can get back to those things and, and maybe incorporate them into what you're doing in other ways. I'm certainly happy to talk about some of those, but, but the idea of seeing yourself and your family as whole people, as part of a whole unit um, and what that means for how you uh, respond to these challenges um, and, and, and how you treat yourself in, in these moments. I think, uh, your your point about uh, letting parents off the hook really comes from a sense of, um, you know, it's 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 important to to care for yourself because the ways that you manifest stress, the ways that you manifest your exhaustion, are going to be picked up by your young person, and it's also okay for them to see you as a person. <laughs> and so the idea that that um, we're all really trying to sort this out together gives your your young people lots lots of uh, uh, content um, and process uh, uh, opportunities. Well, I guess, you know, just kind of moving on from um, that a little bit, just, you know, the work that you're doing, you know, it's with a variety of age groups, but I think for me and, you know, some of my audience, like something that has uh, kind of processed the film myself and just thinking about kind of fitting this film into the tapestry of, uh, you know, education at large and focusing a little bit more on like higher education and, uh, you know, some of these students, you know, they are preparing to go to uh, college. So I'll start here, I guess, with you, Bonnie, if you have any thoughts of just like where you see the power of self-directed education kind of, um, you know, preparing young people really well, actually, for higher education, because you do have to really manage your own time that much more you know, when you're in uh, school. And certainly if there's, you know, kind of the quote unquote kind of flipped model, like you've got to go through a lot of content before you're coming in. Um, to class to discuss it. And you need to figure out how you are uh, going to get through that content in an efficient way and sort of comprehend it. Um, So yeah, just any thoughts on how this model is actually really well suited to help prepare students for um, higher education? We'll start with you, Bonnie, and then go to Chris. It's a a great question, Dustin. I think um, I'm quickly going to punt to to Chris, who's really the the expert on this. I will share as a parent um, that the, the whole idea of putting young people in the driver's seat of their learning uh, is is just so powerful and so important throughout uh, your child's trajectory um, leading up to higher education. Um, And I can can just speak as a parent and say that um, I think children who have over the course of their educational trajectory been in the driver's seat just by its very definition, sets them up for success in higher education as they, you know, slowly leave the nest. But now I'm going to punt to Chris, who really is the expert on this. Uh, thank you for that, Bonnie. Uh, I, your your uh, usage of the term driver's seat really brought to mind uh, the, the image for me of uh, someone who's been given opportunities uh, in their teens with a, a, a skilled driver sitting next to them to practice driving. And then as they get older, to be able to go out and drive safely uh, and, and responsibly, uh, as opposed to someone who's never allowed to sit anywhere near the front seat for years and years and years and years. And then suddenly at 40, there's something comes up and you need to hop in the car and drive somewhere and they have no idea what to do. Um, uh, the, the, the approach that we take uh, and that so many other uh, self-directed learning spaces uh, uh, do in, in their own context uh, is the idea that by, by developing those executive function skills early and having opportunities to practice them when sort of the stakes are lower, uh, by the time you reach adulthood, you've got a lot more practice managing your life, managing your educational trajectory, um, managing your time, how you allocate your resources, um, and it's like when you look at uh, certain um, schooling systems that are really heavily scaffolded towards getting young people to college, and then suddenly they're in college and those scaffolds are gone, um, it can be a really uh, catastrophic um, uh sense of of being overwhelmed, uh, whereas if the young person is given opportunities to practice before you know taking on a hundred thousand dollar loan. <laughs> They uh, uh, they can be not only better suited for the the way that you manage your time, but also they, there's there's an opportunity for them to come in with a much clearer picture of what they hope to get out of it, 
Um, at Natural Creativity, we sort of uh, use the phrase start with, uh, with the goal in mind. Um, when young people are interested in a project or interested in, in developing a skill, we ask, so to what end? What, what is, how is this going to bring value into what you're doing? How is this going to enrich what you're doing? And sometimes the answer is, I just think it'll be fun cool. Sometimes it's, oh, I really, really want to start this business, or I really want to do this. And and we're able to help them make connections to what they're doing, so that they can see that process of making the connections and then start to practice it themselves. Well, and I imagine just too, like it's that sort of, um, that sort of experience is especially impactful, just in terms of like the goal that any student would have in mind, you know, especially in the in, in school, like, you know, these are students who are kind of like, you know, uh, downtrodden, like they've been, you know, not well served by uh, their public school experience so far. So they're, you know, they've kind of now been caught and are getting the opportunity to uh, get this more self-directed learning opportunity. So I'm curious, just in terms of those kind of structural inequities that are playing out um, that we see in the film for those students, you know, just maybe speaking kind of broadly of like, you know, how does, uh, unschooling show up in these moments of kind of supporting those students who may have not been uh, as well served in uh, other educational environments and um, yeah, how unschooling might be able to, you know, better serve them. So Chris, if, if you want to start with this and um, we'll see, I guess, yeah, Bonnie, if you have anything you want to add. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I think uh, particularly with the young people uh, in the movie, um, and having gotten to know them pretty well over the last several years, uh, I think it's it's a challenge when um, you get this glimmer of of who they are over one two years, um, and and some of the backstory of of how they've gotten to that place, uh, and then it's sort of at times it can feel like the responsibility is on us to help them get out of that, and uh, there's a certain amount of that that we are totally happy to to take on with with the parents um, but I think there's also uh, the, the the development of a sense of purpose and a sense of self uh, that will drive them even uh, when they they leave us even as they move on so that they can continue to to, to drive that uh, process um, it's the those those inequities they aren't fixed they aren't dissolved by a short window in a really cool place as much as I wish mm-hmm. they would be. Um, but what we focus on is how do you as, as an individual young person and how do you as a family develop a creative and flexible sense of, of how you work with the resources you have work within the systems, develop an understanding of how those systems work and interact um, and, and, decide when and how you want to engage with them. Uh, so uh, we're, we're really hoping, I think there was a, a line in the movie about um, deciding whether or not to get up from the table. Um, and, uh, and I think there's a part of that, but there's also uh, how, do you, how do you really reconfigure the cards you're dealt in a way that can work to your advantage? Um, and some of that is really identifying your strengths, um, identifying the, the ways that you can you can um, uh, excel within those areas. Uh, but I also think it's uh, specific to our problem-solving approach that we take with young people and help them develop so that regardless of what obstacles are in the way, they've got a skill set that allows them to, to work through them. And I'll just uh, interject that... I think the other thing you see in this film that, Chris, I would love to to have you talk to a bit is the critical role of community and community engagement. You see it in the film. It's it's an important piece of natural creativity's um, place in the world and speaks directly to some of the challenges of equity and accessibility that that Dustin, you raised. So Chris, if you could talk a bit to that, I think that'd be wonderful. Sure. Uh, I, I think one of the, the, the goals when we first set out to start natural creativity that we've been uh, pretty true to, and, and there's always room for improvement, is very purposefully bringing together a diverse community, um, uh, racially, socioeconomically, um, and, and in a way that allows every person to feel connected to uh, a 
bunch of different people that they may not otherwise interact with. Um, I think there was a, a study a few years back that said uh, in urban centers, uh, the uh, particularly in the Northeast, uh, a student in in uh, an underserved uh, neighborhood school, their world really looks like eight square blocks from their house. And that can be really isolating and alienating from from the, the larger society, uh, and and because we draw from across the the city and beyond, um, and have a very local uh, neighborly feel, uh, we have a lot of opportunities for individual young people and families to connect with people and families that they may not normally have had a chance to, and to really lean on those in different ways and find different ways to contribute. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about right now uh, with the, the pandemic, the work that our facilitators and our, our families are doing to stay connected, to arrange for uh, resource transfers, to arrange for uh, people to have support around things like rent and utilities. Um, uh, just the ways that, that we've been able to, to maintain and build our community uh, have been really uh, awe-inspiring as, as I sit back and do the behind-the-scenes work and watch them sort of uh, really, really work uh, super hard to, to keep the community together and to see the families respond and feel connected. And even as we look at uh, the Amani, Jaya, and Miles of the world as they go out and still feel connected back with us. Um, it's 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 really the that that level of community and that type of intentional community um, that we really want to maintain um, and continue to improve upon uh, is 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 really important to us. Yeah, I think that's just a I don't know. It's just like it just feels good of just like that idea of like you know again yeah like kind of the uh, the burden or the pressure of like how you're kind of acknowledging where it's like well we're not gonna you know certainly not like, you know, quickly or overnight of like solving these whole systemic kind of structural inequities, but, you know, we can at least work on that individual level to build that capacity to have kind of the, you know, the confidence or the skill sets to be able to, um, you know, uh, succeed in college or any of those things, you know, just kind of uh, be able to press onward and move forward and move up um, and achieve whatever goals, uh, you know, that individual young person might have. Um, like that just like it's like okay yeah <laughs> uh, supplement that with one of the the uh pieces that i really like about this work is when when a lot of people hear something like self-directed learning or, or child-led learning or whatever terminology they use they tend to think of education as a very individualistic pursuit um, and in many ways it is but i think uh communities like natural creativity like the the other uh self-directed centers uh, around the world, um, there's this creative tension of individual pursuits within a community environment. And so where are the levels of, of each person's uh, uh, freedom, where, where are their, their obligations to their, their community members? Um, and it's, it's a, a complex part about being a member of society. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of value in doing that work. Uh, and so on one hand, individually, they're able to develop the skill set so that they can uh, maneuver in the world in which they're presented. But also they, they develop a process awareness and a systems way of thinking to be able to use those skills to help improve the way the systems work for other people. So we're hoping that there's a, a, a ripple effect that grows out of uh, the the number of young people who get to experience this sort of learning environment. Very important point to make uh, is, yeah, like certainly we can really like in terms of like our emotions and different things, like, you know, control ourselves and like how we react to things. But yeah, we also do live in communities and live in the world. And like, you know, yeah, it's kind of that systems level thinking of how everything kind of fits together and the impacts that we have um, and can have uh, on the world around us. So um yeah, really fascinating stuff. And I guess, um, you know, as we're kind of moving on here in terms of just like trying to um, work better to kind of integrate this kind of, uh, you know, educational philosophy or um, just a better understanding, anything like that of just in terms of, uh, you know, the resources that you could point, you know, uh, parents and families to or um, anybody just like, you know, maybe it's stuff that 
you're kind of consuming that's kind of grabbing your attention or stuff that you feel like is a really good um, resource, like a good go-to, we'll certainly, you know, have ways to um, connect with uh, uh, Natural Creativity Center uh, in the show notes and everything. But, um, you know, anything in particular that you'd want to give kind of a, a tip of the hat to that we could uh, link out to as well. And I guess for this one, I could start with Bonnie. Yeah, if you want to kick us off for this one. Sure. I, I encourage um, folks who are listening to go to the Unschooled the Movement website, unschooledthemovement.com. So we've got a um, wide symphony of, of resources there, including resources and content from natural creativity. Uh, and when we come across interesting articles or conversations or TED Talks or or pieces, we actually post them in our resource section. So it's a it's an interesting go-to. So encourage folks to go to the unschooledthemovement.com website. Uh, yeah, I, I, I second that. Um, at Natural Creativity, we've been, uh, because of our relative age and our focus, very internally focused. So um, a lot of our resources that we've uh, come to rely on and produce are really context specific. Um, and I'm certainly happy uh, to share those um, with anyone as far as uh, a part of a conversation where we can uh, talk about what's what's the moral to the story for their specific context. Um, uh, but Bonnie's point about having uh, unschooled the movement dot com available as a as particularly as a as a resource archive and and a way to keep up with this sort of thing in real time uh, is is a really helpful helpful piece. Awesome, yeah, it's good to have that uh, kind of evolving hub of uh, resources and stuff there. So we'll definitely link out to that. Um, well, then I guess uh, sort of on that point. Um, you know, in addition to those things, it's going to be kind of the I think the primary place for folks to go for. Um, you know, kind of follow up on this, but, um, anything for either of you, um, uh, just in terms of like other stuff that you're, you're reading or listening to like podcasts or, you know, audiobooks and those sort of things, like anything that is just like, you know, um, personally or professionally related that you'd want to kind of highlight. Cause I think it's just cool to see like the stuff that folks on the podcast are consuming. And, you know, certainly sometimes we're seeing like, uh, these really interesting people all, all kind of consuming the same stuff, which I think will hopefully provide a pattern and be like, Oh my gosh, I got to go check that out. So many, you know, so many cool people are uh, listening to that podcast or something. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious, anything that you are seeing out there that's really just been, uh, resonating that you might want to give, uh, um, give a shout out to, um, in addition, obviously to like all the resources that are going to be, um, in the, uh, unschooled website there, but, um, yeah, anything that might come to mind. Well, I'll, I'll jump in and say that, um, I will say over the past few months, I've become much more judicious on what I listen to and read because there's just a cacophony of noise <laughs> that can either profoundly frustrate me or scare me or send me into whatever emotion there is. So, I find myself um, being very narrow, more, far, far more narrow than I've been before around what I consume. My daily go-to, frankly, is the daily. Um, mm -hmm, so I'm sure you've mm -hmm. heard that from other folks before. But I find that um, uh, um, just sort of an even-handed conversation. Uh, I, You caught me on a good day because I, I was just celebrating the fact that with – uh, two young people in my house under the age of four uh, and uh, the work for natural creativity. I have just recently finished a book that I've been working on for about eight months, <laughs> um, 10 pages a night, um, uh, Sapiens, uh, which has been a really fascinating read. Um, I uh, do like to uh, catch... Um, uh, John Oliver, his show, I think, especially during the pandemic, has been a really uh, uh, helpful um, resource for sort of consolidating around issues and uh, looking out uh, outside of it and being able to laugh. Um, and uh, the the next book I'm looking to, to take on is uh, a book, uh, Decolonizing uh, Na Nonviolent Communication. Um, we at Natural Creativity uh, use nonviolent communication as a framing tool for how we understand the individual young people, families, uh, and conflict. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful set of tools. Um, it is also... Uh, uh, potentially rooted in some uh, a more um, 
privileged uh, practices that we will, are always looking to be mindful of, of checking our privilege um, and, and our assumptions. And so I want to dig into that and, and really see how we can revise our practice. Um, I also uh, have started listening to a, a new podcast, uh, The Parent Scoop, um, by uh, a, a former colleague uh, and now friend at uh, University of Penn Graduate School of Education. Um, uh, it's meant to be a place for people to gather and talk about education issues um, from parent, uh, from practitioners and policymakers who are actual parents. So, so it's a, a place to sort of let the rubber hit the road. The film on schools has been shown at a variety of, of film festivals and conferences uh, across the country, and most recently a virtual screening hosted by South by Southwest EDU. Um, we, we'd we love for um, higher ed geek listeners to join us at our next screening. And if folks go to unschoolthemovement.com and sign up for the newsletter, they'll be able to find out when the next time the film is is screened and the next panel conversation, et cetera. So I, I encourage your listeners to do that. Yeah. That was, uh, as we wrap up here, I wanted to make sure that, yeah, we uh, kind of clarified that of where folks can uh, catch the film or just get the latest uh, news and stuff of uh, uh, when it might be um, available elsewhere or anything like that. So um, definitely make sure to um, have that linked specifically um, as best we can down the show notes, but um yeah, I mean, I, I I've seen the film. It's 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 a great watch. I mean, it's just um, such a interesting snapshot into this you know unique model and these student stories. And um, yeah, if you uh, get the opportunity, by all means. I mean, especially just being able to have the opportunity, um, you know, for those facilitated panel discussions and stuff too. I feel like just processing this like for me now, this has been like amazing. So I'm hoping yeah, folks can also kind of have their own opportunity to do this as well. Um, in addition to, uh, this awesome conversation. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for all that you shared and being uh, willing to hang out here for the podcast for a little bit. And, um, yeah, we'll definitely, again, have all the ways to, uh, connect with, uh, all the resources and stuff down in the show notes. So, uh, thanks again for your time, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Dustin. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.